so my most recent book is called the gypsy goddess and it is a retelling of the 1968 kilwin money massacre that took place on christmas day uh, in the village in east tanjore district where 44 dalits working class agricultural laborers men women and especially a lot of children were burnt alive to death because they were you know waging a wage struggle asking for higher wages and i think it's a very poignant chapter in indian history that's never told and uh, for me to go and you know visit it was to connect back with my own roots because my father's from tanjore landless and he grew up in an in extreme poverty so to just kind of know the dynamics of what went there how early communism held a ray of hope uh, for hundreds and thousands of people it was important for me to say that story uh, i think the title is a uh, you should read the book actually to understand the story of the title because uh, the title is a kind of you know me basically trolling the hell out of the novel form because i think this this is a novel that i intended to write not just to you know like tell a story but also to uh, you know like play with the form break all the rules you know not have a protagonist the village is the protagonist there and so one of the things to play with was also the idea of the title and how the title is married to the rest of the book and does it have to even have any relevance so i think that title was one of my you know playful whimsies but it does have a kind of uh, you know resonances towards the text and you know in inside the text as well so that's all i'm going to say about it uh, i think there is a certain tendency that you know uh, that we have fostered in writing in which we assume that the reader is a very lay person and the reader doesn't want to do hard work and that we take the reader's uh, stupidity or intelligence for granted you know so that's why very often you have you know the the protagonist being one single person who carries the story one single person who re- reappears throughout the story but for me it was very important to you know like assume that there are very intelligent readers readers who want to know all points of view readers who want to know the larger story readers who understand that sometimes you know history is not just about one person but it's also about the collective because what i think the general culture of consumerism and global capitalism this we started celebrating the individual and at some point forgotten that how important it is that we function as a collective how important that is that we subsume the tiny differences of individuality in order to you know fight for a larger goal and kilwin money is a testament to that it's about a village that resist the most oppressive feudal landlords that you know like is not at the receiving end uh, that's not at the receiving end of you know state uh, mercy or care and so the state it, it's a village a complete story of resistance of how when will it stand up together so for me to you know like capture a story like that was very essential and important because i think especially even as we all have individual voices like my poetry is quite a individualized voice i think it's important that in terms of crisis we become a collective because only then we can give any kind of a position uh, i think i think this is also it's a very very i think uh, very suitable and in fact a question that i haven't got from many other critics but i'm very happy to ask this question because what i think is that uh, the fo- there's always this whole you know dilemma or dichotomy between the form and the content and people like to talk about how the form is different and the content is different but i think some in a lot of times the content starts to dictate the form and when the content is about a village united it's about people struggling under the communist flag under the red flag of communism there is so much of you know collective activity going on there so that that collective becomes the voice so you have a chapter which is called the marxist party pamphlet and that captures the kind of the mood of 1960s tamil nadu the kind of wage struggle that people are involved in so in in a, in a sense yes it is the content of what's going on in that village so how do you capture that village do you do you tease out individual characters there are very strong individual characters but somehow you know like um, the sum is always greater than you know the individual numbers or something like that they say in maths so it becomes like that so the whole is greater than the sum of the parts so i think that whole to concentrate on that was partly really influenced by the communism by the idea of the collective by the idea of what the manifesto says workers of the world unite so you have to you know like give them a united front to talk about it i think the novel opens with a chapter called notes on storytelling in which 
I actually discuss all these problems in, you know, like choosing a single narrator, for instance, choosing a kind of, you know, like timeline. Do you start with plays? How do you give the history of a place? Uh, talking about the problem of academic writing, because, you know, this could be covered under academic writing. So, for instance, Professor Kathleen Goff has written so much on rural Tanjore, like nobody can parallel her. And uh, so, do you just, are you just happy that it's already in academy or do you want to retell it yourself in much more accessible form? Or, you know, like the kind of journalist writing? and then again the you know so there's a whole chapter that you know like makes fun of all these kinds of writings and stuff like that but then there are other chapters in which uh, for instance uh, to talk about the brutality of what happened to these 44 people I use the police records uh, and I use the way in which there are these post-mortem kind of reports inquest reports the police file in which these people are just numbered bodies in which you just listen about how the body is extremely charred how the head is missing in a body how you know like like the, the police dis decide it's a woman because of the presence of female genitalia. So this is how it is. So for them, you know, in, in a sense, the police force itself is desensitized. You know, it's, it's not a person. It's, you're just a body. You're a charred body. You're a charred limb. And that's how, you know, there is a whole de dehumanization going on there. So yeah, there are chapters like that, uh, which are again very experimental in one in which it's, it's slightly like a parody of, uh, you know, Tamil feudal film in which there's this grand landlord hero, you know, who tells very masculine things. So you try to borrow from the medium of the film. And there's one chapter which is kind of, you know, like only about the persecution that goes on inside the minds of people. So it's, it's much interior monologue. And then there's one chapter in which I'm inviting the reader to come and visit Kilvin Mani and, you know, see things for herself or himself. And so I think I've, you know, been really experimental and somehow made it all fit together. Uh, I don't think I would ever say that I'm an outsider looking in. For instance, my father was called Kandasamy, partly because of you know the work of a communist activist called Manali Kandasamy, who was underground in the in the same period my father was born, and he was very popular in the Tanjo region. So there is a certain latent communism that you know like infuses you. And uh, I also think that um, the outsider's pers I, I chose to write a communist, uh, let's say, a very political novel. Partly because I'm a communist and I believe in communism and I don't think it's not at all fashionable these days. I think it's fashionable for writers to say they are neutral, but I, I don't believe in neutrality. I believe in the class struggle. I believe that we all have to, you know, unite and fight and we should rise above identity politics. And th for me, communism is very, very important. So, yes, I am proud of calling myself a communist.